Good evening and welcome to Late Line. I'm Steve Kinane. The chaos of the US political system with its ongoing threats of government shutdowns is something we normally get to watch from afar. But could we be heading towards our own Tea Party moment? And could it happen before Christmas? This week, the Treasurer, Joe Hockey, said if Labor prevents any increase to the debt limit, there is no choice but to start massively cutting government expenditure. The Parliamentary Secretary to the Treasurer has told Lateline that the Labor opposition is behaving irresponsibly and has likened it to the Tea Party. Labor is playing politics with our debt limit. Labor is driving us towards a situation using Tea Party style politics where Australia now has uncertainty surrounding the circumstances of what will happen with our debt limit. And the simple reality is that Labor just needs to face up to the task that we do not intend to govern like them. We want to visit this issue once. If that's the case, why is the Treasurer talking the language of crisis? Why is the Treasurer, you use the Tea Party analogy, the difference here, it's the Treasurer who's threatening to bring down government services. He's the one who's actually saying he'll have to do all of this shutdown for a limit that couldn't possibly be reached on all the information we have anywhere near 1617. Our Friday Forum with the government's Steve Chobo and the opposition's Tony Burke coming up. And you can join the conversation with tonight's guest tweeter, Sununda Cray, an editor at The Conversation. Just follow the late line hashtag. Now for our regular Friday Night Forum with Opposition Spokesman for Finance, Tony Burke, and the Parliamentary Secretary to the Treasurer, Steve Chobo. They join me earlier in our Sydney studio. Steve Chobo, Tony Burke, thanks for joining us. G'day. Sure. Let's start with the debt ceiling. Now, Steve Chobo, Joe Hockey says he has no choice but to bring in massive cuts to government expenditure if Labor does not approve the $500 billion debt ceiling. But he could accept the $400 billion figure Labor has agreed to, or he could publish the economic forecasts so the Parliament can make a decision based on those numbers. Sure. Is the Treasurer manufacturing a crisis here? You know, Steve, it's extraordinary that this is Labor's position on this. I mean, I've actually got with me uh, from PFO the economic uh, statement. We see here $370 billion of peak debt that's predicted under Labor. And this is the Treasury minute that was actually tabled by uh, the former Treasurer, the member for Lilly, which from the Australian Office of Financial Management, which makes it very clear that they need a 40 to $60 billion buffer. So 370 plus 60 is 430 right there. And that's before we even deal with the, th with the fact that, for example, we've had to pump nearly $9 billion into the Reserve Bank Reserve Fund because Labor kept pulling uh, extra special dividends out of the Reserve Bank. So the simple fact is this. Labor is playing politics with our debt limit. Labor is driving us towards a situation using Tea Party style politics where Australia now has uncertainty surrounding the circumstances of what will happen with our debt limit. And the simple reality is that Labor just needs to face up to the task that we do not intend to govern like them. We want to visit this issue once. We want to get it up to 500 billion because we know that is more than adequate cover. And then that way we don't have to visit this issue again, unlike Labor. And we saw yesterday the shadow treasurer say, well, we just, this will get you through December. We don't want to get through on a month-by-month -month proposition. We want to deal with it once and settle it. Tony Burke, it was your side of politics who brought the debt ceiling in and uh, during uh, the Rudd-Gillard governments it went up from $75 billion to $300 billion. Why are you being so obstructionist on this when you were in this situation yourself of wanting to raise the debt ceiling? Well, it's hardly obstruction. What Steve didn't read on the first bit of paper is what year the 370 applies to. And the year I think you'll find there is 1617. But why do you want to visit now, that? Now, the, why do you want the to issue is really issue simple. Though, Tony? All Joe Hockey has to do as Treasurer is release the full budget update. He's saying he's going to wait till December. He brings it forward, releases a full budget update. But your if, that provides, if that provides the information to justify it, then fine. <laughs> if not, if not, there's no urgency. You're, you're, but see, this is the is point, Is there Steve. any chance that you're going to go to 400 soon? We, but Any chance. See, see this, is, this is what Labor just doesn't get, Steve. The Labor Party says, well, this isn't going to happen for another two years, so we don't need to worry about it. Labor doesn't get that we want to provide certainty and stability to the financial markets. At a time of economic tumult, frankly, the last thing that we need is to have this hanging over our heads. So let's stop playing politics, Tony. Your side needs to get that we want to deal with this issue once and put it behind us. Don't play politics on no, no, this. If, yeah, on your own is, numbers, it's $430 billion. We had to put money into the Reserve Bank. There's $440 billion. So stop playing games. Let's deal okay. with it once, and then it's done. Steve, then it's done. two things. First, the, there's an argument about how much money you had to put into the Reserve Bank. And uh, 
your treasurer is still refusing to release so the letter of that, being, of that being requested. Three or four but the second issue, the I didn't talk over risk. you and you're not going to talk over me, Steve. Right. Uh, the second issue, though, is that the 400 that's on offer is more than enough. It's not. You'll be able, it's more than enough for your, for your current purposes. And to say, to say as you just did, that what the government wants is to give the market certainty and stability, if that's the case, why is the Treasurer talking the language of crisis? Why is the Treasurer... You use a Tea Party analogy, the difference here, it's the Treasurer who's threatening to bring down government services. He's the one who's actually saying he'll have to do all of this shutdown for a limit that couldn't possibly be reached on all the information we have anywhere near 16, 17. All right, now, to many economists, this whole debate is a complete farce. Already our parliament scrutinises the budget bills and Australia survived 107 years without a debt ceiling. Sure. Why do we have one? Well, I think this is an important uh, distinction between economic theory and practical politics. Uh, the reality is this, Steve, that uh, the reason you have a debt ceiling is to prevent Australia from getting into a situation that's akin to what we've seen with debt to GDP ratios in excess of 100% uh, in European nations and you know, the United States and, and countries like that. We want a debt ceiling because we want there to be restraint on government's opportunity to borrow money. Now, Labor largely was unfettered. That's the reason why we went from net assets to now having a mountain of debt approaching $400 billion and expected to exceed $400 billion on Labor's own figures. Now, that's the reason why we say let's deal with this issue once, let's not play politics. We don't want to kick the can down the road. What Tony's basically saying is let's kick the can down the road and we'll deal with it again in another year or two. That's what they did in the US. We don't want that. Tony Burke, you were a member of the Rudd government. You were a minister of the Rudd government when they increased the debt ceiling. Oh, sorry, it brought in the debt ceiling. The respected economist Saul Eslakes thinks too many of you were watching too much of West Wing at the time. Why do we need one when it causes all this chaos? Well, what it does, it does provide an extra level of discipline on, on government, and both sides of politics agree that that's a discipline worth having. But a lot what of I economists think that, are saying you don't need a Chris yeah, Richardson, no, no, no. Saul Eslakes. That's right, that's right. Um, and uh, there, there were more who came out today. Lots of economists have that view. There's a political discipline that both sides of politics agree on. The thing that has been extraordinary here is that after spending the whole lead up to the election campaign railing against debt and using lines like, if debt's the problem, more debt's not the solution, nobody thought that the people saying that would then have as one of their first actions that they'd ask permission to take debt to half a trillion dollars. <laughs> What a disingenuous... See, this okay, is such a... Point, we're going to move on. Well, this is a disingenuous argument because the former Treasurer, the member for Lilly, himself admitted that the debt ceiling would have to go up purely as a consequence of Labor's legacy. So for it to be claimed that this $200 billion is all Liberal Party is ridiculous. All right, I want to talk, I want to talk about the Parliament this week. Tony Abbott promised a grown-up government. This week, Christopher Pine, the Leader of the House, was calling the new opposition leader electricity bill in the Parliament. Now, is that an act of a grown-up government? Uh, you know, look, we used to have, uh, again, the Labor Party talking about sloppy Joe and these sorts of comments. I mean, I'm not going to be lectured to by the Labor Party. Uh, the reality is that, of course, we all believe that parliamentary standards should improve. So should the uh, Speaker have made... ruled that and said well, that was I'm, unparliamentary? I'm not going to revisit and I'm not going to reflect on what the Speaker's done. You've uh, the, you've reality, that, really. the reality is that what we're going to do, we supported the Speaker. Uh, the reality is what we're going to do is make sure that we raise the standard of Parliament. Now, I'm not going to say to you that every single time it's going to be wonderful, but we generally want to see an improvement in parliamentary standards and we'd hope Labor would join with us in doing that. Tony Burke, you called this, uh, this, this title, Electricity Bill, being named in the, in the Parliament as it was, as cheap schoolyard name-calling. Was it any worse than you likening the new Speaker, Bronwyn Bishop, to Dolores Umbridge, the, uh, the cruel witch-turned-headmistress in the Harry Potter books? I actually likened the entire Parliament to Hogwarts and used an invisibility true, cloak true. reference and to And you said to that um, Dolores later. Umbridge is running the school, so that, I take right. it you were referring right. to Bronwyn so, Bishop there? Yeah, and when you're talking about... When you, when you use a Harry Potter reference, everyone's uh, going to be like that. The difference was, look, what um, Christopher Pine said wasn't the worst insult that's ever been thrown out around the parliament. The difference was he wasn't asked to withdraw it when it was raised. Normally, something like that said, if someone takes offence, and there's no evidence from what I've seen that Bronwyn Bishop took any offence at all to what I said, uh, but if someone takes offence, normally they're asked to withdraw, they withdraw, and everyone gets on with it. The difference this time, he wasn't asked to withdraw, and when it was raised and the dissent motion was taken, it was ruled for the first time that that sort of name-calling now is going to be considered okay, even if people do take objection. That 
is a big shift. All right, let's move on to the proposed parliamentary reforms. The government is pushing for changes to rules governing the parliamentary procedures, including uh, allowing only ministers to move a motion suspending standing orders. Now, isn't this a bit rich, uh, given that you had close to 100 uh, suspensions of standing or uh, attempted suspensions of standing orders during the last parliament? You know, and Steve, if, if I listened to Tony Burke, I'd think that was an accurate summation too. But the reality is that it is the same motion that was put in the paper, uh, put on the notice paper, by the Labor Party when Labor was in government and in fact was a motion that was put on the paper under the previous coalition government uh, under John Howard. So there's absolutely nothing new about this. Uh, Tony's been out there trying to make hay and trying to claim that this is in some way um, a startling new revelation and an example of this government uh, being keen on secrecy and controlling the parliament. That's not the case. This is a standard motion that's been moved under the Labor Party and under the coalition previously. Uh, Labor needs to take a cool drink of water, calm down and get on with the program. So, so, sorry, but are you saying, therefore, the standing orders won't be changed? It's just I'm there, saying, on, the, it's there saying, on the notice paper, but like what has happened in previous parliament, parliaments, there won't be an attempt to enforce I, I'm it. I'm saying you shouldn't be hypocritical, Tony, because I think what people have had enough of is the Labor Party being hypo hypocritical. Uh, they've had enough of, for example, you saying you want a better parliament, and yet you are very happy to use and abuse parliamentary rules so that the Vice President of Indonesia was kept waiting for 45 minutes to meet with the Prime Minister while you yourself played games on the floor of the parliament. That's what people have had enough of. The Prime Minister could have left at any point. Do you think there was in danger of you losing your majority? Uh, the Prime Minister couldn't have left at any point because the very next thing the Prime Minister had to do was introduce the bills in opposition no, no, the, to repeal the carbon tax. You're in charge so of the order of legislation. To, he had to yeah, wait. No, you could have, was, you could he have was switched there waiting the order. to do that purpose. You could have switched the order of the legislation at any point, or Christopher Pine could have stood up, said, to help the parliament I withdraw, and it was all over. Well, but the, the uh, taunt the leader, and the teasing the was leader, more important to you guys no, no, than keeping to the time for the, the Indonesians. The leader of the opposition never asked for withdrawal, and that's a key point. Well, never I, asked for withdrawal. I want to move on and talk about asylum seekers. Uh, today we saw a very different kind of Friday briefing on asylum seeker po uh, policy. Lieutenant General Angus Campbell gave more information about why secrecy was important to the operations than he has previously. There was a bit of a move as well from the Minister to distance defence from the political aspects of these briefings. And also Scott Morrison's tone was a little bit different as well. He was less dismissive to journalists asking questions. Were these changes an omission by the government that they hadn't got these briefings right in recent weeks? Look, Steve, you, you, you're applying a whole bunch of assumptions and sort of reading of the tea leaves in terms of uh, the way you've put the question. Uh, let's talk about what's going on with Australia's border sovereignty. Uh, as you know, we introduced a military-led operation, Operation Sovereign Borders, uh, and let's look at what's happened because in the last couple of days we've seen Labor trying to claim credit for a reduction in the number of boat arrivals. In the last eight weeks, the number of uh, asylum seekers coming to Australia by boat was around 700. In the previous eight weeks, i.e. before we were sworn in, under Labor, the number was 3,400. So we've gone from 3,400 to 700. Now Labor says, oh hang on, this is all because we introduced new regional processing arrangements. Mm. Well you know what, that's not the case. Because the eight week period that I talk about where there were 3,400 was after that announcement. So we're comparing apples with apples and the stark fact is this, there has been a 79% de decrease in the number of boat arrivals into Australia and that's comparing eight weeks under us with eight weeks under Labor after the announcement. Tony Burke, when you were Immigration Minister you wanted to stop the boats, is the Coalition doing a better job than you were? Oh, what they're doing is they're implementing the policies that we started, the policies they took to the election. Uh, like going around fishing villages and buying back boats, they haven't been doing. The turnarounds, they haven't been doing. Uh, what, if you look at the figures that, that Steve just referred to, the impact of the policy changes that we had was you had week on week a significant reduction in the numbers. By the final two weeks leading to the election campaign, it was down to one boat a week. Now in the last week there's been three boats, I'm not going to claim that's an increase from us. Uh, effectively what's happened is the numbers have gone right down. It had happened by the time of the election campaign, it was down to one boat a week by then. What they are doing is they've realised, as we told them, that the crazy policies they had about buying up fishing vessel vessels and doing the turnarounds and towbacks weren't going to work. What they had to do was implement the regional arrangements. That is actually what they're doing. Okay. They've changed the media strategy, I'll give them that. But that's all. All right, Steve, I want to talk about a specific issue because this week it was re revealed uh, there was an asylum seeker who was separated from her newborn baby boy who was in hospital in Brisbane with respiratory issues. Sure. Apparently she could only visit her baby for six hours a day. Do you think that is inhumane? Uh, look, I think what's happened there is regrettable. And I noticed that today the Minister uh, has indicated that he's in asked his department to... Uh, 
undertake a further review of the situation and investigate what's exactly transpired. I mean, it is regrettable what's happened. Uh, but the simple fact is this, that in relation to this particular area, there's been no policy change under us to what there was under Labor. Uh, and I would certainly hope that Labor doesn't attempt to point score out of this because there's been no policy change. Uh, the incident's regrettable. Uh, we'll get to the bottom of it. The Minister's undertaken to do that. And we'll look and at this we'll to make know... sure this won't happen again? Well, I would hope that that is the case. And I'm, I've no doubt that that will be the situation going forward. So, Tony Burke, could this have happened under Labor? Oh, look, I, I'm not going to grandstand on this. If they are saying that it shouldn't have happened, then I agree with that. If they're putting steps, uh, issues in place to make sure that it doesn't happen again, then that's good. I'm not going to try to point score on everything. OK. Um, Kevin Rudd decided to leave the parliament to retire from politics this week. Now, Mark Latham uh, channelled Paul Keating in his column for the Fin Review, saying that Bill Shorten has had a rainbow hit him in the backside with the departure of Kevin Rudd. Is that a fair description? I don't, look, I've, I, I just think so much has been said, and I'm, I'm one of the people who's made comments about Kevin over the years. I just think at the end of the, his political career, he's a former Prime Minister, we can all show a bit of grace and wish him well, wish him and his family well, and look at the, the sorts of positives, like the apology, like the handling of the global financial crisis, like the extraordinary political victory over John Howard, and I think that's the right way to deal with it. Steve, you got some nice things for, to say for your fellow Queenslander on his retirement from Parliament? I mean, the fact is he was Australia's 27th Prime Minister, uh, and he's deserved and accorded respect as having reached you know, the pinnacle of Australian politics and leadership of our nation. Now, I'm not going to be quite so flattering in saying that everything he did was wonderful, uh, there's a very serious legacy that we've got to deal with. There were, unfortunately, some uh, very poor policy examples that took place under his leadership. Uh, but that notwithstanding, uh, this is hardly the time or place to go on the attack on those things, and I've got no intention of doing that. Gentlemen, we've run out of time. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Steve. Thanks. Thanks.